Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here with me. My name is Joan, and I am a principal engineer at GenAI, and I'm here to present the presentation called MLOps for Python and ML Engineers. Please let me share some words about our company, GenAI. So we were founded around a little bit longer than three years ago. We are around a little bit more than 50 members in the team. And although we are distributed around the globe, our main offices are in Germany and China. So just check our website and you will see exactly what we do. So let's go through the outline of this presentation. First, I want to get an overview of the ML in MLOps, so kind of discuss what are the use cases, challenges that all these deep learning powered applications have, what motivates us to build what we are building, then we are going to have an overview about this MLOps platform that Gina provides. Some of these names will make more sense as we go through the presentation. So we are going to present Docker A, then Gina. We are going to see how we provide observability, how we go in our journey through to the cloud with Kubernetes, and then the, our last part of the stack, that is jCloud. And at the end, we are going to have the typical conclusions that we have in a presentation. So let's see. What are the typical use cases that right now with these deep learning models we can see? So we can have generating embeddings, neural search, all the generative AI, LLMs that are kind of a sub, sub part of this generative AI, and all these umbrella term of multimodal AI that has appeared now. So embeddings are right the foot of many of the, the main foot and source of force for many downstream tasks in, in AI. So what is an embedding is a vector representation of any object. It can be text, it can be images, audio, whatever. And we just try to represent in a vector. And the job of the model is to make sure that this model, that, that this vector has some meaning, some semantic meaning. When it comes about representing um, about neural search, it means that similar objects are close to each other. When it comes to generative AI, it means that at the coding step, they represent nice pictures or nice generated content, whatever. Then we see, for instance, generative AI. This is something that everybody has, everybody has been astonished in the last years of how amazing pictures have been um, drawn by just giving prompts like this. So like a stable diffusion, DALI. I'm sure everybody has been playing around with ChatGPT, with all these GPT models, Llama, whatever. But all of these kind of, it comes to a new trend of, L, of AI that is this multimodal AI we like to name, where kind of text, images, videos, audios are inter, they interchange the roles, they play together. I'm sure that at some point, or already there is a model that given an image will create a song for you that is inspired by this image. So one thing that is worth mentioning is that for building these applications and working with these models, Python is by any is good or bad, but it's the lingua franca for these applications. Most of the deep learning frameworks are, are written in Python. Python is by far the most popular um, language for these ML practitioners. And although Python has some lack of, of performance, it's worth mentioning that a lot of the problems are being solved. For instance, um, Python is going to a more strongly typed frameworks, and most of the work is actually done in, in other low-level languages, and Python is only the binding, the binding part. I'm th I think there was a talk about this before, where a Rust library was bound to Python via some bindings. So most of the problems are actually kind of hidden and masked away. Okay. So what is a typical workflow of a, when we try to deploy or serve or build these projects? So first, we need to train the model or create a POC. Sometimes you, we don't even need to, tr to train the model because all these already provided models out of the shelf can serve our, our, our application properly. We just have to create the POC to make sure that we have the results that we expect, right? Then we need to serve this model because very rarely you will only use it yourself. You want to serve it to your clients or to your colleagues or whatever. You would use a serving framework, web, uh, web, um, ASGA. Then we might want to have observability to make sure what goes well, what goes wrong. And then at some point, you might want 
to deploy to the cloud whenever you need a scaling, you just don't want to run it yourself, you have more needs, right? As you can see, well, I think that there is a trend in these MLOps, like as long as you go to this ladder, you need less ML, lang ML skills and more ops skills and the other way around. So I want to present this MLOps framework that in Gina we have that tries to help the ML engineer to go through these steps in the most smooth way we can. Okay, so I have presented the MLOps platform like this. So we have two main components that are Dockery and Gina that you see at the center. And I want to emphasize that Gina and Dockery don't do it everything on themselves. We don't reinvent the wheel. So we somehow integrate, use, make it easy to work with a lot of these technologies that are already awesome to work with. We make it easier to work with PyTorch or TensorFlow. We rely heavily on Pydantic, gRPC, or FastAPI. We make sure to use OpenTelemetry, Kubernetes to, to, to ease the journey to the cloud, for instance. Okay, so first I want to see, to present Docker Array, that is the component that we expect to make your life easier when you build your POCs locally. Okay, so it's worth mentioning that it is a project that we developed and we donated to LFAI, I think back in November last year, but time flies. So basically it's a Python library for representing, sending, and indexing multimodal data. So it's, it supports, it's, uh, um, its focus is to represent this multimodal data and to put the embedding at the center. As I said before, embeddings are like the food that every downstream application eats for breakfast. So we want to make it easier for you to, build, to work with these embeddings. And there is the, this new component of the ML stack that appeared in the last years that are the vector databases. So we make it easy for you to index this data and to retrieve this data from these databases in a seamless way so that you can change the, your backend very easily, so on and so forth. So it might make sense better later when I show some code snippets, but um, Docker is modularized in kind of four models. There is the data representation where we have the base document. We have some containers where kind of we group efficiently and we, it lets you work with groups of these documents. Then we have a typing module where we kind of have helper methods for you to work with multiple data, video things, audio things, so that you work more efficiently. And then we have document index where we allow you to get these docs and index them in vector libraries or vector databases where we have HNSW, just in memory, we support VV8 Quadrant, Elasticsearch, so on and so forth. So the, the data representation module, it has the base doc, is the main cops inside the Docker array, and one can think of it kind of, is a, it depends, Docker array depends a lot in, on Pydantic, so you can see it as a Pydantic based model on steroids, so to speak. It helps to represent multimodal data, and it's ready to be served, uh, to, be, to be serialized into JSON, into protobuf, into bytes, and so on and so forth. And there are some kind of predefined documents that we have built for you to, to work easily with multiple model data. Then for typing, it's just a set of classes and helpers that you can enjoy to for better, we will see later. And then for containers, we have two set of containers to work kind of in, a, in two modes. We have the doc list that is kind of, it behaves like a Python list, and it is intended to be served, to be used kind of in inference workloads. Kind of it just, um, it's kind of a raw-like structure. And we have the doc pack. I'm not a fan of this name, but it's kind of a columnar oriented a structure where tensors are grouped better together so that it's more thought for training um, applications. Okay, and document index, as I said, is where we get the integrations of all these um, vector databases. But this makes little sense out of the box and, unless you see the code. So let's see it more or less in, in action. So we are gonna build a small POC that is going to compute some embeddings, okay? We are going to have an encoder class that has an encoder method. Let's see what are we need here. So we do the imports from Docker Array. We import from the main modules, the base doc and doc list. And we import from this typing a torque embedding um, class that is going to help us work with embeddings that come with torch. Okay, then we define our types, kind of similar to Pydantic. We define our text and we say that our output is a torch embedding of the dimension 384. This is going to help us validate the dimension of the embeddings, which is something that is some, it's very often quite a struggle to work with. 
Then we just wrap our model and we expose the model in, an, in a method. I mean, just um, regular programming. And we just use it and we get an embedding out of it. Then we can go and expand it to build a neural search application. For this, we need an indexer in this case. No? So in this case, we import uh, from the index part, we import a, a method that is going to help us index and retrieve um, documents from memory, kind of without the scaling or anything, without any extra um, work. Then we, we get our results. As you see, the results here is very nested because kind of the result you want the object that was the query and the results as matches. So it allows you to get this complex representation. You build the indexer, you wrap the index, and you build an index and search method. Combining with the encoder before, we get an application that given an input matches whatever was indexed. It's quite a toy example. Or something that is more fancy, the generative AI. Let's build something that given a text will give us an image from that prompt. Kind of the same story. Here we use an image doc because it's going to help us um, um, work with images. We wrap the method, we generate images, we call it, and voila. OK, so far, um, Docker Ray has not made a lot of work. So it has helped us reason about our data, model our data in a very nice way, um, and so on and so forth. But what we mentioned before that is ready to be sent with Protobuf, with JSON, and so on, is going to shine now that we are going to go to the next step. We are going to use, try to use Gina to serve these applications. OK? So first, I want to say, what is Gina? Gina is a framework, it's an open source framework that is used to serve models and AI applications to the network via gRPC, HTTP, or WebSocket. Basically, is consuming Docker A's ins and Docker A's outs as structures. Okay. It allows to do batching, it scales them, it has a Pythonic and YAML interface, and it makes everything ready to go to Kubernetes and to scale. It, it is also exposing telemetry data, tracing, and so on for you to make it, to, to, for making your life easier. Okay. Gina is structured in two, in two basic layers. So we have the serving layer where we the object executor lives. This is the main layer, the main object that will always be there. This is the one that consumes Docker arrays, and it lives in your Docker container, in your process, wherever, and it processes Docker arrays, and it does changes, and it serves via the network. Then we have another, another layer that is orchestration layer where we have deployments and flows. This is a layer where we configure the executors, and we decide how these executors are going to be served. But it's important to mention that this orchestration layer, the, ob the objective is that eventually it goes away and we let Kubernetes take over. So we have built this kind of simple uh, orchestration layer to serve some, some use cases. But at some point, if you want to go to the cloud, we will keep the executor. We will co keep all this serving part that consumes the carries in and out. But we are going to let Kubernetes orchestrate it for us because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. OK, so the executor, we will see it in action later, but it's just a class, uh, kind of you just inherit from a class, and it allows you to expose these applications to the network. It allows you to configure for batching, dynamic batching. It, uh, um, it allows to expose metrics and spans and whatever. And in combination with the, uh, with, the, with the orchestration layer, it is served and scaled efficiently. In the orchestration layer, we have deployment that is an object that configures how the executors serves data. And it also makes sure that um, it is scaled as it's desired. So it's kind of a simple orchestration layer in terms that it makes sure that the executor is alive at the beginning. It makes sure that the resources are cleaned at the end. but it cannot dynamically scale. It cannot dynamically underscale. So that's why I say that in the future, at the next stage, we are gonna we will want Kubernetes to take over this job, and it's important that it has a Kubernetes translation to to uh, to YAML that we will see later. Flow is kind of 
has the same API as a deployment, but it's intended to work with for microservice architectures where you need more than one model or more than application and work together, scale differently, and so on. Okay, let's see it in action. So let's see how we can serve a single model, for instance, the generative AI application that we had before. Okay, this is the code that we said that just works with Docker. And by doing this couple of changes, we are gonna be able to expose it and serve it. Okay, let's take a look at the changes. So we import from Gina these executor and requests. We make sure that our class inherits executor so that it becomes an executor and is ready to be served. We add this decorator request and we say that it's gonna be serving in this generate endpoint. Then we are gonna use a deployment to make sure that we serve this application. We are gonna use it two protocols, gRPC and HTTP, and we're gonna serve in these two ports. It's important to note that these two protocols are not two, two replicas. They are, they are two servers sharing the event loop and serving both in gRPC and HTTP. You even have Swagger UI and so on to, to, to make sure that you, see, you have a rich documentation of your API. And then also it's important to say that this deployment, as, as well as you can play in Python, you can play with it in YAML. And then you just call it. We have a client that you can call it with gRPC or HTTP. And the same way you have worked with your class before, now you can work with it remotely and get the same results. Then when the flow comes in is when you want to orchestrate two or more executors together. Like in the case where we had neural search, I don't know if you remember, we had an encoder and we, have a, and we had an indexer. So in the encoder, we are gonna do the same. We are gonna import executor and request and expose it. The same for the indexer. In every endpoint, we are making sure that every function is exposed to, to the network as an endpoint. And here we are telling a flow that it will listen on these ports, also will expose the same protocols. And we are telling them that they will use an encoder that at index, it will use the encode method. At search, it will use the encode method that it will use two replicas. And we are gonna then use the indexer. What is the point here is that you can scale differently your first executor, the encoder, than, and the indexer. And as the same way as deployment, it's kind of a compositional pattern where a flow is just a composition of deployments. It also has a YAML interface. And the same way we can call it and have the same result. So many of you, I guess, might wonder what is the difference? So this, everything that I talked about might remind you about FastAPI and Pylantic. And you might wonder what is the difference? I here put a versus, but it's not a versus because we are very inspired and we are glad to say that we are kind of friends <laughs> with FastAPI and Pylantic. So they are awesome projects. The, the main difference I would say, and we are very inspired, the main difference I would say is that we are kind of more restricted in terms that we are more designed for machine learning use cases, well, wherever uh, these um, frameworks are really more general and, and are thought for any software application. Then also we put this embedding at the center and we use protocol like we are able to use gRPC for, for communication, which is important to, to serialize tensors and so on. And also what is different is what it come, will come later is this orchestration layer and how we can help you move these applications that look like a fast API Pylantic application to the cloud and to add telemetry and so on. Okay, so let's see how we use how we expose in Gina traces and metrics to add observability to your ser services, okay? So basically Gina emits automatically if you configure it to do so, traces and, and metrics and via open telemetry SDK, we, we, we expose it so that you can consume later by different services like Prometheus or Grafana or any other service of your choice that can, that can work like that. So basically it's as easy as 
um, telling in your YAML applications that you want to expose metrics and tracing, and where do you want them to be exposed for you to consume later? And it exposes the typical metrics that you would expect from, from these applications, like what, are, what is the request time, how many, how many um, requests have succeeded, how many requests have failed, so on and so forth. And for traces, is especially important for flow when you have the typical spans for each microservice. But the thing is also that we expose a easy, Py easy Python API to expose and to enrich this data with your own monitoring um, logic. So for instance, you could use custom metrics via the corrector or via context manager to make sure that you, had, you can fine grain um, the access to this application, for instance, where am I spending more time in the pre-processing step of my executor or in the actual inference or whatever? This is for you to build this logic. And for tracing, it's the same. It's a little bit more complex because the spans are a little bit more complex, but you can add spans of your request as you wish. And then you can consume in, in your favorite backends like Prometheus or Grafana. And then, as I mentioned before, one of the objectives is that once you are, have built your POC, you are, you are able to serve your, your model via an API. You have make sure that you have observability in your service. At some point, this is not enough, and you might need auto-scaling. You might, you might have a lot of needs, and, or you might not want to run it locally, and you want to, to deploy to the cloud. So how we deploy services to the cloud, I, I want to make a first recap about what is the cloud, more or less. So the cloud is someone else's computer, as we often hear. It just happens to be that this, uh, this someone else is normally a cloud provider, right? These cloud um, components normally have Docker containers as their, as their first class citizen. So more or less, what is a process in your host can be more or less logically mapped to a Docker container in the cloud. Most of, at least Gina in the platform, but a lot of components are relying on Kubernetes to make this journey to the cloud in an easy way. This cloud has challenges and benefits that come from scaling, auto-scaling, exposing the service, isolation, and resource management and so on, and something that is especially important for AI workloads, that is the serverless capacity because resources are expensive, especially GPUs and so on. So what is Kubernetes? I don't know what is the knowledge of Kubernetes here. So Kubernetes is basically a container orchestration platform. It is important to say that it's open source and has a large community which makes makes it cloud agnostic. The community has, been, has made sure that every cloud provider can support this, so you can run it in Google Cloud, in AWS, and whatever. So something that I, what is an orchestration platform? What, something that I like to think about of Kubernetes is kind of like if you had a, the perfect DevOps engineer that could just go in every, every node of your cluster and um, check if the service is up every 10 seconds or whatever, so this super powerful. So Kubernetes is this super awesome engineer that every 10 seconds or every, whenever you configure, it does these tasks. So if you know how to configure, it's super powerful. Okay, what is, and how does Kubernetes work? So Kubernetes has a set of objects that they call um, custom resources, and they work in a Kubernetes, in a declarative way. So what you are saying to Kubernetes via YAML, you are going to say, I want this object to be in this state. And Kubernetes is going to try at its best to make sure that that object ends up at this stage. And it does it with um, their main objects, the objects that are native to Kubernetes. These are pods, deployments, and services. And with custom resources that any, you, anyone can can manage. So what in the architecture point of view, it has nodes where you want to scale your application and distribute your applications. Every node has this kubelet, the kind of a daemon, the same way that you have a Docker daemon in your local when you talk to the, when you have a Docker command that you talk to your Docker daemon. 
um, Kubernetes nodes have this small daemon kubelet that makes it available for this control plane that is kind of the main node and the manager of everything to communicate to it, so to make sure that it schedules the actual workloads, containers, and pods in the right places. And in this control plane is where um, the, your CLI or your SDK, everyone talks to this control plane, and there is the scheduler that makes sure that everything is scheduled to work wherever it is intended to do, and the controller manager where you can write your own operator to manage your own objects. So how Gina employs Kubernetes to do the, to do this, to take over the orchestration part. So basically what we do is translate these deployments and flows in a quite naive way. It seems from the outside, but quite easy. We translate these objects and we know how to translate it into, into Kubernetes deployments. What, there is a magic behind that we kind of know how to override the entry points of the Docker containers, how we set up the startup profs, what is our endpoint for health checks, so on and so forth. But this, this expects you still to know quite some about Kubernetes, and you would still have to handle autoscalers, horizontal pod, pod autoscalers, and so on. To help in this last mile, we have this last part of the stack that is jcloud. So think about deployment made easy. Up until now, if you follow these steps, you are good as long as you have provisioned your resources, you know how to manage Kubernetes, you enable monitoring, gateway, certificate, security, whatever. Compare this to doing Gina Cloud deploy and your flow YAML or word, your deployment YAML without caring much about this. So what is jcloud? jcloud is beyond some CLI and SDK and an API. It's basically a Kubernetes operator and a set of custom resource definitions based on Gina flows and deployments. And it's, it knows how to, manages, to manage these objects more efficiently. It comes with autoscaling, GPU resource allocation, um, it uses, it exposes your services, DNS, well, blah, blah, blah. And it's not only serve, it can not only be served by us as a management, but also, it, since it's an operator, you can take it with you and it can be self-hosted, so it's kind of easy in this bring your own cloud paradigm. So the conclu conclusions right now, so I have tried to make clear how Gina provides a platform to help ML engineers build and deploy AI services. We have seen how Docker Array helped you from having a POC to serve with Gina AI. How Gina can remove its orchestration layer to move it to Kubernetes. And how at the end, jcloud can make this even more um, seamless and more easy by providing this operator and this API. So thank you and I'm welcome to take any questions. Uh, I have a very probably simple question. Uh, if I have uh, this uh, land chain, how uh, this general uh, platform can be uh, integrated with this kind of uh, uh, library? So there are two ways. So you could just have Langchain in one of your executors as deploy the service as Langchain, or the other way around, and we have already been um, successful as adding ourselves as a Langchain dependency because Langchain is kind of a monolithic platform that works locally here. So for instance, we have a plugin to help with you with Docker A. I don't know, one of the vector indices that are most popular on, on Langchain is coming a wrapper around Docker A, or we have our own embedding models served with this Kubernetes approach 
and that's exposed as an API wrapped from Langchain. So this is the way we integrate with them. Yeah, so I'm also one of the uh, co-maintainer of uh, of this Gina project. So I face the question of, uh, so what's the difference between Gina and uh, Longchain, especially this year, right? It's because Longchain now becomes kind of very popular in the uh, generative AI, and uh, people start to build prototype and uh, thinking about using Longchain production. Uh, so I think the the philosophy behind Gina and, and Longchain are quite different. So I. I, I would compare Gina to more like a Kuberflow or uh, Airflow, uh, which is based on the all the philosophy of cloud nativeness, right? So you have you need to have microservice, you need to wrap the model into a Docker container, and then you need to connect all these Docker containers to do some high-level task, right? So if you look at Gina source code, it's all about this. Containerization, setting up the protocols, using gRPC, compressing the data into binary format, and then communicating all this microservice in order to kind of orchestrate some high-level task. But if you look at Longchain, it's very different, right? So Longchain is, is a very monolith program where inside Longchain is basically a string manipulation. Uh, happens everywhere. So it's a, one can say that it's a prompt orchestration framework. So it's not really like a microservice orchestration framework, but it's prompt based. Uh, so it's most like a prompt serving framework. Uh, so in that sense, uh, I, I wouldn't compare uh, Longchain versus uh, Gina in, in that perspective, even though that uh, you know, both from both uh, architectures, there is a concept of a flow or chain stuff, but you know everybody hate flow, right? So, <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, so that's that's why. Uh, so that's you know from our explain our, our perspective, this is uh, you know the difference between. Uh, yes. So I what I believe is uh, the future uh, generative AI applications or multimodal AI applications is a combination of model based technology and prompt based technology. Technology, right? So, uh, long chain uh, and some prompt serving framework can be used as what John said as one of the executor used for pre processing, for example, uh, on constructing the prompt, right? On building an instruction prompt uh, from the template, from, uh, you know, from the uh, prompt database, all these kind of things, right? And then you feed uh, the uh, prompt uh, with two. To a llama, right? To a kind of self-hosted service, and this self-hosted service is running as an executor inside uh, Gina, right? Uh, yeah, Longchain is one of the executors. Yes, the whole orchestration is still uh, organized by Gina or uh, Kubernetes, right? In this case, right? Yeah. Yeah, so we had, uh, I think we have Gina Embeddings as a plugin, for instance, in, in Langchain. Langchain, at the end, is really a Python, of, a Python program that calls different services and kind of wraps things. We have our own wrapper for Gina Embeddings that instead of computing the embedding locally, um, kind of uses our client to send, to compute the embeddings that are working as scaled in Kubernetes. Yeah, but the general idea, I would say, is more intuitive to kind of feed a monolith program into a microservice architecture uh, than the other way around, right? Uh, so feeding a microservice service architecture such as Gina into a monolith program such as Longchain is less intuitive. 